As an adult, it's pretty much like when you're a kid and you're pretending to be like a fireman or like a wizard or something like that. So it's just like playing pretend for adults, you know. And uh, I think things that really inspired me were shows like Star Trek. I mean, like I was growing up at a really good period of time with film. I think you know, Lord of the Rings was coming out, Spider Man. Uh, what's another one? Anyway, all of these world building films were coming out and I think that's what really attracted me to, to acting. It was like, you know, wanting to be in these films or shows that were like larger than life and, you know, portraying <clears throat> as much as my generation raves about how the 80s were the greatest decade ever. I will admit that, yeah, that, that the double odds was a really good period. The late 90s or the really double odds, we saw some, some many neat stuff from that. Because, yeah, Lord of the Rings, like Daniel Craig took over, uh, as well as uh, was, uh, I also like, was exposed to uh, probably movies that were too mature uh, for me to like, really understand. Like, I, I watched The Godfather when I was like four. Um, Pulp Fiction, you know, all of these just like films that some of my age shouldn't be watching, but I just became like obsessed with, you know, film and TV. I, I Mom, say it what's me. a gimp? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that scene, my mum would always be like, leave the room, and I'd always be like sticking my head out and being like, what the hell is going on here? But, you know, when you get older, you, you kind of realise why you shouldn't be watching those films. Hey, it, at least you kicked out for that stuff. I was part of the HBO generation where just like things would go on, my parents just sort of look at each other, then look at me, and my dad's like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> Did, were you uh, like Sopranos era as well? You know, when oh. HBO became like HBO. Oh, well, I, did, yeah, I, was, I was at least in the home box office years. And I actually remember when HBO did really good original programming before The Sopranos had did what, not to knock those shows, those are brilliant, but I go back to the Philip Marlowe with Private Eye with the uh, Oh, with wow, so Powers way Booth. back, yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm that old. Yeah, I'm, you don't look it, that's yeah, good. Well, thank you. I'm good genetics. Pretty good for 55. Yeah. 55? <laughs> yeah. You're not 55. Get your license out. Damn Get, I need some identification. I don't have it on me. I'll show it to you after. Okay, okay. All right, that's good, that's good. So uh, I mentioned uh, some of this. Uh, it's about Fantasy Island. Uh, that, yeah. that, was, that, was an, that was an interesting project. It was... Uh, yes, it, it was. I almost felt like it, it needed to come out three or four years before it did or needed to burble and, and simmer for another few more years. But I, I, thought it, I, thought, I thought it was solid. Yeah, and an interesting fact about, uh, I mean, not the film, but does anyone remember who was in the original TV series? Ricardo Montalban. And does everyone remember who he played? Yeah, exactly. So I feel like in a weird way I was kind of following in his footsteps unintentionally. <laughs> Had a good company too. Uh, there was a... It blipped for a second again in the late 90s, but uh, Malcolm McDowell was in a remake uh, series that lasted once, produced by Barry Sonnefeld. I didn't know that. Malcolm it, McDowell's a good actor, it, too. It, he plays phenomenal. the new Mr. Rourke, and oh, the first thing he does that's good is. good casting. Yes, the really first thing costing. he does is take those white suits and burn them. And he's wearing a black <laughs> suit. So, right, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's edgier. It's very edgier. Oh, okay. The people that go to the island, Sometimes they get punished instead of rewarded for what they want, and I'll leave it at that. You can find. I think it's 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 trickling on YouTube, this, but yeah. it's it's way way smart, and it, it should have gone on. But then again, so much good stuff that usually does. Uh, and uh, again, talk, let's talk about the video game work. The quarry was that just straight uh, VA, or was that some motion capture, or a little was, bit of both? It was mocap. So uh, they had me. I think I worked like three weeks every day, but I got that role in 2019, and they had already shot the tutorial of it with uh, three of the other actors and then we all got casted. We all met, I think, January 5th in, uh, in Los Angeles, 2020. And then a week later, uh, everything stopped and the world changed. So I was sat at home in Australia, just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then I got the call, I think in December, asking me to come back over and then it was sh straight into it. They did body scans. I was walking around like 
in when we were filming like pretty much in a in a scuba outfit with a bunch of dots in my face a helmet on my head and and a camera right here and we were in a, a, a completely empty room that was a little bit smaller than this but it was surrounded with all of these tv monitors and you could see yourself as your character and if they wanted it to be in the forest you were in the forest if they wanted it to be at the campsite you're at the campsite and you pretty much just had to use your imagination. The script was 900 pages long. Um, I believe there's over 300 different ways that you can finish the story. And in all of them, I get bitten and turned into a werewolf. Um, but yeah, it was just really fantastic. I had to just completely surrender myself to, to my imagination. And even the, after I was turning into a werewolf, because it's pretty much just me, like this and I'm crouched down they're like all right turn and I'm like ah like doing all of this just this like crazy stuff um feeling like a bit of an idiot but it looked incredible and even all the kissing scenes like every well it was COVID but also you can't kiss when you have these big helmets on so there's a scene where I kiss one of the actresses and I'm sat on a chair like this but it's a log in the um in the game and they're like okay now you're kissing her so I had to pretty much just like pretend I was kissing kissing the air and I think they let that go on a little bit too long because <laughs> it looked entertaining. But, um, yeah, it was just an all-around fun experience. Really good actors too. They, it, it is interesting, especially since uh, it, it's really grown. I had an uh, old buddy of mine that was on the original Drop Dead, uh, Red Dead Revolver, and, uh, and then he did the sequel and then it was just like, yeah, it's like it's got so much easier because we're all wearing deep-sea diving suits at that point and everything else with the big ones. And so... It's nice that how quickly the technology is evolving and getting better and better, but it's still cumbersome, to say the yeah, least. Yeah, and I think it's um, it will never compare to film and television, but I do think it is a a new growing medium, and we are seeing these video games that are very like enriched with story, as opposed to just playing like in your a skater on a skateboard or just shooting a bunch of people. They're really focusing on that, and it's just oh look, really more good... zombies. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just a really good evolving medium. And um, I think it'll be just as big as film, uh, but not bigger. No, no, people still do it too. But yeah, 900 pages though, that's that's a doozy. Yeah, and I didn't read it all. Well, um, I'm 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 did they let you? Usually they're pretty selective. Oh, no, they, they sent me back to Australia with a big, big folder of, of which I didn't want to carry. But um, they sent me back home and I like read through it and I think I got to page 600 and I'm like, I don't need to read everything that happens because you're filming one scene and you have to react depending on what your your character you choose as the character. So I could play one scene out five different ways, and so it's all different dialogue depending on the yeah. character's reaction. Yeah, absolutely, I remember uh, God rest his soul, Kevin Conroy told a great story about the difference between. Uh, standard voice actor and stuff like that, the voice of Batman, he said, it took me two days, uh, three hours, two three-hour sessions to do an episode of Batman. The first Arkham game took nine months, five days a week, th five hours a day. That's, that's really long. Yeah. I know Seven, um, Jerry Ryan, when she does ADR, mm -hmm. she does it so quick. She's just in and out, and I wish I could be like that, and, but it's just such a process. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And speaking of Star Trek... Uh, how did uh, how did you find yourself uh, part of the uh, Final Frontier? What was the what was the uh, when did it blip on your radar? Hey, you want to come on and read for something? Did they tell you up front what it was? Well, they didn't tell me up front, so I had just come back from filming um, the first half of Fantasy Island, and because I, it was a Blumhouse film, it kind of it put me ahead uh, back in Australia because it was an American production, so people wanted me to audition for a lot of stuff. And um, I get, it's like two days left. I'd done all these auditions uh, back home and I, I don't think I did the best job. And then I get this script called The Writing Room or The Writing Desk. And I'm like, this sounds really weird. Like what kind of show would be called The Writing Desk? And I see produced by Patrick Stewart. I'm like, oh, I wonder what this could be. And then um, I, I get sent these scenes with a character called K-Bar, who's an alien, and this captain who's called O'Toole which I don't know, good choice. Um, and so we, I, I went into the, the day before I flew to Fiji to continue filming, I went into the audition room, did all my stuff and the casting director was really lovely, let me play around a little bit, uh, do a few scenes in a few different ways and then I left, landed in Fiji and I got a message saying, oh, by the way, this is Star Trek. I'm like, yep, no shit. Um, <laughs> 
but you and 10 other people are being considered for the role. And then like it was either a day or two more days go by and then it was like you and five other people are being considered for the role. And then another day or two goes by. At this point I'd gotten this like crazy uh, chest infection just from being in Fiji and probably drinking too much and working too late. And uh, I get a message, the the producers and the director of the first episode want uh, want to give you notes and then we want you to record them, like record the scene with the notes given. And so I did that with a, a, a bed sheet in a hotel room with someone who's never read before in their life. They, you know, they're trying to act and it's just like, no, just read the lines. Just don't try and act. You're going to throw me off. And then I, I did that and then I got sent, uh, I think it was like six in the morning I finished filming and I get a call saying, oh, they're sending a contract over. You've gotten uh, the gig. And I didn't care because I'd been working like 18 hours and I just want to go to bed. So I go to sleep, I wake up, and then I'm like, oh, shit, like, did that really happen? Yeah. Like, so I call them up and they're like, yeah, like, once you finish filming in like a week and a half, you're, you're, you have to pack all of your stuff up in Sydney, go back home to Melbourne, say goodbye to everyone and wait for your visa. And I'd say the audition process wasn't, the hardest part of it, it was sitting at home waiting for my visa to get approved. I actually lost my passport the day before I was meant to go into the embassy. I turns out I was just under my bed, but <laughs> I I was panicked. I was panicked. I'm like I'm if like I, I can't go into the embassy without my passport, so I cancelled my passport, found my passport, called them up, and I'm like, oh, like can we un undo that? And they're like, no, you have to go through the whole process of applying for a passport. So I went into the office and I'm like, I need this by tomorrow. We paid for it to get rushed. And then I went into the embassy and then like two days later I was flying to, to LA to film. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very, very roller coaster journey. A lot of anxiety, a little bit too much. Uh, absolutely. What was, uh, what was the craziest day you had on the uh, Picard set? Crazy, define crazy. Well, just the one that's a doozy. I mean, uh, not necessarily for bad reasons, but just, you know, it's a, it was just getting there or maybe the first time you saw yourself in the full makeup or... Okay, so I've got two. I'll go season two first because we were filming with these really strict COVID uh, procedures and um, I hadn't seen anyone for a long time. So second day on set, I'm going around, I'm hugging everyone, even though you're not meant to because I didn't care. Um, and then I go in the next day and the, the testing procedure is they give you a rapid test and then they give you uh, the antigen test. And the antigen test takes six hours for, for it to reveal a, a result. And the rapid test takes like 20 minutes. So after I do the test, I go into my trailer, they're like, oh, well, you'll be out in like 30 minutes. I fall asleep and I wake up and it feels like more than 30 minutes has gone by. I'm like, well, something's not right. And then I get a knock at the door my trailer, I open my trailer door and people are standing like 12 feet away from me. And I just remember opening it being like, what's wrong? And then they're like, you've tested positive on the, on the rapid test. And I was like, I haven't seen anyone, like this, this is bullshit. And they're like, well, you, you gotta take two more rapid tests um, and then you gotta wait for your antigen test, but we've gotta shut down filming. And we were shooting at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. It was the most expensive part of filming. So even if you get a false positive, which mine was, filming still gets shut down for two weeks. So it's shut down for two weeks, but while I was waiting for my antigen result, someone called me on the phone, they're like, who have you interacted with? And I'm like, I have interacted with everyone. And I, I'm like, I interacted with Patrick, I hugged Patrick, and then I was freaking out thinking, I'm gonna give Patrick Stewart COVID, and he's gonna die. And then I'm gonna be known as the guy who killed Patrick Stewart, and that's it, forever. That's that, so that, that was like, a pretty crazy story. Like the story. guy that gut punched Houdini in camp. Yeah, and that's all I'll, I'll ever be known for. And then another, uh, this one's a bit inappropriate. Well, before you go to that one, when did you get the, the, the follow-up test, uh, what came back negative? Yeah, but I was already on the way home and set was already shut down. <sighs> so they couldn't do anything. There was like a part of the, the policy or the, the rules in place, if there's any kind of positive, whether it, it's revealed later that it's false, they still have to shut down filming for two weeks. Oh, God. Yeah, bad move by me. Well, not really, just poor testing. No, it, not your fault. No, definitely not. Shouldn't have hugged everyone, but <laughs> yeah. Lesson learned. 
lesson learned. No, I, I still <laughs> hug the, everyone. For the, for the next pandemic, not that we ever want that to go through yeah, that again. Yeah, knock on wood. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, all right, what's the second one? So the second one, season one, does everyone remember the outfit I'm wearing? Okay, so you can't pee in that outfit. Uh, you have to get completely undressed in order to, in order to, um, to go to the bathroom, but it, it gets really hot and I sweat easily. So they would be putting ice packs all over my body. I mean, here, 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 in the, 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 that area there. And um, I, we were filming in Malibu and um, I was replacing my packs, my ice packs. And I put one down there, like to like a little bit further away from me. And I'm going to grab new ice packs, and then I'm not going to say which castmate, but a castmate stands next to me and is complaining about how hot it is. And he's like, "Thank God for these ice packs." <laughs> Touching their face with an ice pack, and I look over, that ice pack's gone. So, yeah, that that's that's another crazy story. <laughs> and they still don't know to this day. <laughs> they won't know. <laughs> what they won't know won't hurt them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, I, I should know this, but I'll slow it out there too. Uh, what was your experience? Everybody probably asked you about, uh, about Sir Patrick Stewart, but uh, I love stories about working with Frakes. Did you work any of the episodes you directed? Yeah, Frakes directed my first ever episode and he looked after me like no one, no one else did. Like Patrick was, was really good, really supportive, but I, I, um, he's, I fell in love with Jonathan I loved him as Riker, but as a person. Um, so we were filming at Universal. He is an actor's director. He he's just a, a an all round great person. Like I love that man. And um, we were filming at Universal. I, I lived like fifty minutes to an hour away because I was staying closer to where we were filming majority of our stuff. And my call times were like three, four in the morning. I was in Los Angeles, Australian driver's license, couldn't rent a car. So I was Ubering everywhere and the Uber wasn't allowed to drive into Universal Studios. So I'd have to walk from the front all the way to, about, to the back, which was like a 40 minute walk. And I'm walking one day and this guy pulls up in a truck, winds down his window and it's Jonathan. He's like, get in. Starts asking me all these questions. He's like, why are you walking? Like, what's going on? Hey, get in. Yeah, it, it felt it felt like out of a movie, you know, like hop in, kid. I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll hop in. And um, after fil- he said, after filming, come and see me. When I told him about my early starts and everything, and then he walks me over to the producers. He's like, we're filming here for another week. This is what he says in front of me. I thought I was getting in trouble, but I wasn't. Uh, the producer says yes, and then he just turns to me and says, he gets to stay at the hotel that's right here. And then the producer said, yeah, how long do you want to stay here for? I'm like, the whole week? And he's like, yep, yeah, no problem. So he sorted me out with really, really nice accommodation at the Sheridan Universal. And he was always really supportive. He could tell how nervous I was starting the, like, being in a, in a show that big. And, um, yeah, he was just there every step of the way. And I love him. Uh, any fans of Mr. Frakes? <laughs> I should have done the Riker. Manu- uh, oh, well, when I sat down, I walk around the big yeah, no. <laughs> well, me too. So. Well, thank you so much for indulging my capricious curiosity. Uh, I'd like to invite our audience. Uh, how, who thinks they may have a question? Let's see some hands. What, nobody. No question. No. I all right, all right, sorry, I'll do this. Then I'll, I'll I'll go around handheld it. We had a bunch up. We do a line. So I'll put that there. So be mindful of time. Whoops. Hold on. Oh, it's got a stand? Yeah, yeah it's a little kickstand, but it's busted. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Hi, I'm Tony. Hi, Evan. How Hi, are Tony. you? Um, do, do you? Do you get starstruck when you're acting with all these uh, actors you've seen on TV or movies, like I, when you saw Patrick Stewart for the first time, etc.? cetera? Yeah, I, de- I definitely do. I mean, when I met Patrick for the first time, he said, Hi, I'm Patrick, and I said, Good, thanks, <laughs> instead of saying, Yeah, and... Um, <laughs> Even when I was acting across from him, I just saw his, I don't know, it's, he's been doing it so long, but I, I just think he is very much like an actor's actor. He's always wanting to try different things. And my second or first day filming, it was with everyone. And it was scary because you've got all of these, these people have been acting for years, you know, countless TV shows, really big films. And then here I am having just done a film that, even when it came out, not many people saw. But you know, just I, I've got no proof of of why I'm why I'm there. So imposter syndrome, I'd say, like kicked in a lot. 
during season one, they mentioned a character's gonna die and I immediately thought it was me. So I spent like the rest of the season panicking and I got my first ever gray hair <laughs> because of that. But you get, you get used to it because you stop seeing them as these people who are on, on TV or you, you stop associating them with their character and you just start associating with them as, as people. So it became a lot easier, but it's still very daunting um, initially. But yeah, if he wanted to act in a scene tomorrow, as long as it's not like Shakespeare, I'd be more than happy to. Yeah. Cool. Great question. Thank you. Great question. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Tony. Uh, who's got another one? Do, 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 do. Yeah, I'm going to hear Yes, I will be on the cruise. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, what's your name? My name is Grace. And what happened? So I broke my ankle last year, and I had a lot of hardware put in, three plates, 20-plus screws. It's all healed, and so I had the hardware removed less than two weeks ago. So I'm healing. Did the removal hurt? Um, well, I was under general anesthesia, and it, it hurts a little bit, but not nearly as bad as the two surgeries after. Have you got any spare anesthesia? No. Asking for a friend. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, v- very glad you're healing. So a round of applause for that, you know. And thank you for joining us today, even with this. So thank you so much. What did you want to know? I wanted to know if Evan watches his own work, and if so, have you um, watched Picard? You're shaking your head, so. I, I, I've watched Picard twice. Okay. Now, are you able to enjoy it as a story, or do you, like, nitpick all the stuff that you're doing? I just, I just get so, uh, it's, like, jarring. I, I, can, I can watch the, everything but me um, and enjoy it, but I just, there's something about seeing yourself and you don't think it's real because you know it's not real, so it kind of, like, takes you out of it. Who knows, maybe I'll, I'll become better with it, but there's no point in, in watching it, watching something you've already done because, I mean, you, you do it like eight months before the show comes out, so there's no point being like, oh, my lip's trembling there or I said that line wrong or I should have said it like this, you know, because it's just, it's past work, you know, the, the, the work's done, so I don't think it's helpful. I'll, if I'm auditioning, I'll watch myself because it's almost like instant. And, uh, you, you know, you know what you can work on and what you can do. But, yeah, no, I, I think if I ever have another premiere or something like that or a screening or something I'll do, I'll leave because I just can't – I can't hack it. I don't like looking at myself. Great question. Thank you. Really good question. Mm-hmm. That's that. And here you go, yeah. Oh. Oh. Here, I'll squeeze through. Here, I'll, squeeze through. I'll do this. I'll do my own version of the Riker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ooh. Call that the patty. What's your name? Isti. Isti, what you got? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, what's the most challenging emotionally acting work that you've done, if you don't mind sharing it with us, because I understand that's difficult work. Uh, so that would be great to hear. It's, it's a scene I get made fun of for a lot, actually, online. Um, the scene where it was a long, there was a longer version of it, but there's a scene where I'm crying after Picard dies in season one and people are like, oh, that looks like so, uh, just like fake. Cause like, I'm like covering my face and I don't want to be seen. Um, but that's actually like how I cry, but getting into that kind of emotional state where it's not like forced, where it's like, you know, when you have to cry, it, you get in your head about it and then you can't cry. So, like, I'd say the thing that was challenging about that was I was in the most depressed mood all week leading up to that so I could do a good job, and then it just, like, came out. Like, well, first, we went to film it, and then they said, we can't, we've run out of time to film it today. You've got to come back three days later. So I'm like, okay, so there's three more days of just feeling like shit. And then when we go and film it, uh, I don't like being consoled when I'm when I'm – sad or upset and there's a, a moment that didn't make it into the into the into the cut where Michelle tries to console me and I'm just like I don't shove her but like I don't want anything to do with her you know I, I think I'm kind of like you know when a cat like goes off to die it goes it goes by itself I can't deal with with that with people around I need to go into like my fortress of solitude so that was very challenging because you're in a room full of people with a bunch of cameras pointing towards you and then you, you might not necessarily be acting how your character would act. Fortunately, I think that's how he would act, but, 
yeah, it's just it's just challenging even to cry. I know Margot Robbie can be like, which eye do you want it out of? And, you know, I hope I can do that one day, but that's a little sociopathic, I think. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, yeah. oh, good. I have to walk for it. Hey, what's your name? My name's Bella. Hi, I'm Bella. a big fan of The Quarry. I actually ended up playing it and getting all living characters first try, so I was really happy That's about that. That's what I'm talking about. There we go. Well done. I was wondering, what was your favorite scene sequence to record during The Quarry? Uh, there's two. The, uh, both involve Pop Pop Peanut Butter Butter Pops. So when Zach and I, or Jacob and I, are dancing, uh, doing that because that was a lot of fun, but then the shooting scene when I'm like wiggling my butt in his face because he wasn't expecting that on, on the set either and I like like really go up against him at one point and start nudging him with my butt but it doesn't we didn't use that cut but I'd say those were the, the two f- oh and turning into a werewolf even though it's awkward because it looked sick watching it you know and um you shot me if you if, if Abby was like yeah you shot me well done right good aim <laughs> You had to. <laughs> but how long does it take to complete the, the game at that level? To go through everything? Finn, do you know? I do know. Oh, thank oh, you. <laughs> it is actually, to, to say to sur- uh, for everyone to survive, it takes 10 hours. But if you kill people, it takes around six. So. <laughs> well, it cuts the time in half, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it depends how much you like the game, I guess. Yeah, then we will probably do it. No, okay, did you have a question? Uh, I did. Uh, she, uh, this, she lovely answered, but when you played it, because we had a conversation, you played it, what was your favorite? It doesn't have to be from Nick's perspective, but what was your like favorite part of the game to play? Oh, that's really good. That's a really, really good question. It is still, it, it's still me. Um, when I get pushed into the pool and I tell Caitlin to fuck off, that, that was really nice. With the, Aussie, with the Aussie accent telling someone. And then they push you into a pool and you're still above ground and you're just like, ah. It's just, it's just that, that was fun. Anything that made me feel uh, silly or, or stupid, because I think that's also a process with acting. You have to just realize that um, everyone is watching you and it's a little bit humiliating, you know? But that's the, the beauty of it. But uh, thank you. Thank you for answering. No, yeah. great question. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for asking. Yeah, one for you. And who's this fella? All right, well, then take that one, sir, because, again, I see your hat. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have one for uh, when it's her birthday? Is it her birthday? Have another one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's her birthday. No, 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 no. That's yours. I gave that to you. Oh, I had to come on. I had to do a reef. So, anyway, all right. It's her birthday. All right, here. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Patty. You're welcome. I got a whole bag. I, I got to try to get rid of them all. They'll lighten up, lighten up the load at the airport. Plus, when I go to the scanner, they always look at it funny, too. So, what's this? Candy. Uh-huh. Oh, it is candy. All right. <laughs> so. It's a lot of candy. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Boyd. Boyd. What you got, Boyd? Uh, at this stage of your career, you seem to have done a very eclectic uh, amount of work and different genres and things like that. Where would you like to see it go? Where would you like to see your career head off to? I always... So I went to film school, and I always had this idea of working with people that I really like. Um, and that's kind of what I'd like to do. Uh, it's not really dependent on like a role or a genre. It's just working with people who have the same interests and like vision and drive as you. And then like kind of creating like a community because, uh, Hollywood is tough. And if you like, I I think the prime example of, of a good community within Hollywood is probably like Judd Apatow and the people he uses. I would like to create something similar, but cooler than that but just working with friends who have the same interests and you know uh people i have worked with and are currently working with like my writing partner over there shane um really really good vision really good understanding of just like like what do you find cool in 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 film and tv i find this cool cool i find this i this is what i find interesting cool let's try and like make something that interests the both of us because i mean I'm sure every film and TV show that comes out, they, don't, they want it all to be successful, but no one knows what the formula to that is. Otherwise, every show that comes out would be successful. So it's just about making cool, interesting shit with people that you, you like. 
uh, uh, downstairs, I was talking to Anthony Michael Hall, his Q and A. He talks about how you know he's been best friends with some guys who are you, and they continue to work together and everything else. There's, there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah. You know, I always tell everybody at the anime panels, people always want to know, oh, it's about voice acting. I so, like, you want to do acting for cartoons? Yes. Find yourself somebody studying animation. Your age is someone you get along with in gel, and then become De Niro to his Scorsese, or their Scorsese, I should say. Yeah, no, that's a that's actually perfectly summarized right that's there too. So, uh, who's got another one? Oh, uh, all the way. Down. Hey, what's your name? My name is Patrick. Oh, what you got? Patrick. Hi. Hi. So uh, you were in season one, somewhat in season two. How did you react to not being having Eleanor in season three? We actually all found out like the week before we were meant to start filming season three. So it was a bit of a shock, but from, from seeing season three, there was really no place for, for my character. Um, and if it was, if, if he was in there, it kind of would have been like an injustice, I think, just because of the story that they were trying to tell. Um, but who knows, in a spin-off, uh, you know, one day, hopefully it's not the, the end of this character. But um, shocking, yes, but uh, understanding. It was understanding, yeah. I've, I think it's fairly safe to say we have not seen the last of your character. If I was a betting man. I'm, I'm not holding you to anything, but... Fingers crossed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And don't forget, ter- don't forget, Terry Metalis is downstairs. So just tell him, hey, hey, him, him, him. Yeah, and I didn't die on the Excelsior. He wasn't on there, if anyone... Yeah, just letting you know. Absolutely, absolutely. He's not dead. Yeah. Who's got another one like to throw out? Hi, hi, what's your name? Connie. Connie. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, mean, I got in a couple of minutes late, so I apologize if this had been addressed. Um, how well versed were you? Oh, we covered that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how well versed were you in kind of the lore of Star Trek uh, before you got the role? Oh, my mom's a big nerd. We grew up watching Star Trek, but I and I say this to everyone. So I grew up watching TNG. Um, but I did not like Star Trek when I was a little bit younger because I just wanted to... I was a big Star Wars kid as well. I just wanted to see lightsabers and stuff get blown up and good versus evil. But I think Star Trek, specifically TNG, is arguably some of the best written television ever. And it is way more complex. I don't understand than Star Wars ever will be. I don't understand this Star Wars versus Star Trek thing. Yes, they're both in space, but that's probably all they have in common. Um, so yeah, some yeah, pretty knowledgeable. Um, if I didn't know anything or, or needed help with stuff, I'd ask my mum, or I'd ask Shane, because <clears throat> they between the two of them, they know everything. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. I. Uh once a while, I get to work with Denise Crosby uh, at our table, and she was signing off one time, and her Romulan character, and she's holding the disruptor. Oh, yeah, it's me holding the phaser. And I was just like, actually, it's a disruptor because it's a Romulan. And she was like, oh, shut up. <laughs> I love how um, brazen she is. With, she's with wonderful. Stuff. Yeah. She's absolutely wonderful. So I think I'd have for one more, so we might want to throw us out on a really fun one, or maybe in a direction to go, oh, okay. Ah, makes sense. The one, the one in uniform. Hi. Hello again. What was your name? Tanya. Hi. Um, if you could act with any other actor on any of uh, the Star Trek series, um, who would you Michael choose? Michael Dorn. Yeah. <coughs> Michael Dorn. I think, I think Worf and... I actually think... Controversial. I think it would have been a better storyline, maybe, if, if Eleanor was there in season three. I think that's the only place I could see him fitting in. In, in in that story for season three. Well, but. I, not for nothing. I would... I pictured, it, I pictured an adventure where it was an ongoing where it's like, okay, they've got to go to a planet where there's no technology and no first contact, so you got to go undercover. So, yeah, what happens if your character and Worf basically go to a D&D planet? Oh, that would be you know? so good. Uh, and sick. then some of the other principals have to sort of come along. You know, Troy has to come along because the mental yeah. things and stuff. I'm sensing chaotic evil, you know. So we're, we're essentially um, 
turning it into Lord of the Rings in space, if you well, think about it. Well, just based on an adventure where they're not allowed to use phasers or anything else, yeah. and so, well, you two guys know how to use melee weapons, so yeah, you're along well. for the ride. Yeah, we'll be... And maybe even Patrick, be because he'll have a little fencing sword. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Are you writing this down? We're going to pitch this. Terry, where are you? Terry! We got it. We got a pitch. Hey, so what's uh, anything on the horizon uh, you're allowed to share with us? I'm currently waiting to find out whether I'm doing this job, whether I'm doing this job I should find out today. But I just finished filming this short film um, because I'm really into UFOs and UAPs. And I do think that there are extraterrestrial beings that have like either been here for as long for longer than we have or they've you know come from is it alpha centauri with a dogon tribe uh have, have spoken about i think oh no it's canis um so i do believe that we have been visited and interfered with um from higher beings i mean it's the only thing that kind of like really makes sense so i just i just finished filming that and then that'll be finished editing i think in like a month so who knows, maybe I'll ask to screen it at the next Galaxy Con. Well, we look forward to that. And I've, I, I've always thought that aliens look at us as like the Jerry Springer show of the universe. Oh, what you got? It's called Anomaly. Um, and it's about a boy who, after going through like a breakup, it, it becomes like really obsessed and like paranoid about um, UFOs. And by the end of it, you don't know if it, he's had like a full-blown um, schizophrenic attack or he's actually seen what he's seen. Oh, GalaxyCon 2024, this was Evan Evagora. That was our time. But Thank before, you. before we go, we would like to take a picture of our amazing guest and all of you. If you all want to come towards the stage, not on the stage, but uh, towards the stage, want to take a picture of him and all of y'all. <laughs>